Good afternoon. I think we'll get started. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm Allison Stanger, director of the Roatan Center for International Affairs at Middlebury College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of the International Studies Colloquium. Uh, a lot of you know the drill here, but for those of you who are new to us, lunch is served throughout the program. We're very informal. Uh, our speaker knows we're informal, so feel free to go up and get coffee and cookies. Um, this won't be considered rude, as long as you do it quietly. And uh, we will conclude promptly at 1.30. We will also, in conjunction with the Career Services Office, be doing a career conversation immediately following today's talk. So for those of you who are interested in uh, having a s small group conversation with our guest today, just hang around. We'll maybe break for two minutes and then reconvene as a smaller group for a career conversation. So without further ado, it, it gives me great great, great pleasure to introduce our guest today, who I think is one of Middlebury College's most distinguished alums. Charlie McCormick started as a pre-med major here at the college, but graduated with a degree in English. He went on to earn a PhD in political science from Columbia University, uh, and along the way served as a National Science Foundation Fellow in Mexico City, as a Fulbright Fellow in Caracas, Venezuela, and as a Research Fellow in Foreign Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. Dr. McCormick is currently President, Chief Executive Officer, and a member of the Board of Directors of Save the Children Federation. Save the Children works around the world to make lasting positive differences in the lives of disadvantaged children. Uh, they also support refugee assistance programs in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, as well as humanitarian relief assistance worldwide when disaster strikes. Dr. McCormick was president of World Learning just down the road in Brattleboro, Vermont from 1977 through 1992. He's a member of a lot of things. <laughs> I'll just list a few here. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Executive Committee of Interaction, the Advisory Committee on Voluntary Foreign Aid, and the Food Security Advisory Committee. He's presently served as president of the Non-Governmental Committee on UNICEF and was selected by the United Nations Secretary General to participate in the founding of the United Nations University. He served as a member of the United States delegation to the World Food Summit and the United States delegation to the Preparatory Committee for the 2001 General Assembly Special Session on Children. He is also an, a member of the advisory board of the Clinton Global Initiative and in addition he works closely with Save the Children's celebrity advocates, so he gets to run around with uh, uh, Salma Hayek and Julia Roberts and other assorted individuals. So Dr. McCormick gets around. <laughs> His topic today is the role of NGOs in achieving the Millennium Development Goals. So please join me in welcoming Charlie McCormick back to Middlebury College. Thank you, Thank you Allison. Well, my thanks to Allison. I, she originally said, why don't you come up in February? And I said, no, you know, I remember those beautiful spring days in April when the grass is green and the, uh, the snowdrops are popping up uh, through the lawn and the bright sun is shining and it stays light late and uh, let's make it April. <clears throat> um, it reminds me why Middlebury graduates do well. Uh, you have to be tough to finish four years. <coughs> uh, I used to say down in Brattleboro, nine months of winter and three months of damn poor sledding. <coughs> uh, here we are, nine months in. Um, it's a pleasure, uh, however, in spite of the weather, to be back in Middlebury and at the college. Um, I certainly wouldn't be doing um, what I am doing. Um, uh, were it not for my experience at Middlebury. Um, as Allison said, I did uh, uh, begin as a biochemistry major um, and went uh, two and a half years as a biochemistry major. <coughs> um, but uh, um, at that time, uh, maybe still to this day, uh, Middlebury, the college, uh, had a spring week uh, that was devoted to a particular issue, kind of like your water 
session, maybe this week actually. Um, and they would bring in the world's kind of leading uh, experts and practitioners on whatever subject was the focus of the week. Um, so in uh, 1962, uh, the subject was Africa. And Africa was, a, at that time, uh, essentially still a uh, subsidiary um, of uh, France and uh, uh, the UK and Portugal. Almost all the countries were still colonies, but in all kinds of ferment and, um, and processes of decolonization. So that was the, uh, the topic. And they had uh, uh, two or three leading academics from Princeton and Stanford and Michigan. Um, but they also had a visiting professor f from the Maxwell School at Syracuse named Eduardo Monlan, who was the, uh, the leader of the Mozambique Liberation Movement. So he was the Nelson Mandela of Mozambique. Uh, and part of the deal um, of these visitors uh, was that they would also do a couple of seminars with students. Uh, so I uh, sat in on his two uh, sessions. Uh, and, uh, and his main point was that we, like you, um, were very lucky um, to be able to receive the kind of education that we were lucky enough to receive. Um, and that put us in a very tiny percent of the world's population, undoubtedly less than 1% getting a high quality post-secondary education. Um, and we really didn't have to worry about survival or our children surviving or shelter or having enough to eat, et cetera, et cetera. So why wouldn't we take all the advantages that we'd been given and give them back um, that we presumably had learned how uh, to think and had a little bit of information and, and all these advantages and privileges that we didn't do anything to deserve in particular, but had. Uh, and he also said, you know, these are going to be the uh, most important issues of your lifetime over the coming 50 years, meaning how will the world deal um, with the liberation of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people who have previously been colonized, and how will communications and relations between Latin America, North America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, South Asia, East Asia work themselves out? Uh, and you won't regret um, being involved in those issues because you will be lucky enough to deal with what's really happening. Um, <clears throat> well, I was uh, not enjoying my uh, physics labs, <clears throat> and uh, it was kind of like uh, Saul to Damascus. Um, and uh, I said, that sounds better to me than uh, biochemistry. So, so I changed directions. And, uh, and certainly for me, um, uh, it was absolutely the right guidance. It's not for everybody. Um, some of us are born to be artists, some scientists, some do-gooders. Um, but if it's your calling, um, uh, as it has been mine, um, it's been a wonderful opportunity to get up every morning and feel positively about what's going to happen during that day and go to bed every night feeling positively about what I've done. And say the children impact 66 million children and parents every day, um, providing education, health care, nutrition, protection. So that's a nice way to spend your day. Um, so I give my thanks to both Middlebury College and Eduardo Monmon for setting me on the course. Um, and uh, it's not uh, been most of those years, uh, um, and it's now been 35 or 40 uh, since I left Middlebury, um, that I was hobnobbing with uh, Angelina Jolie and 
um, uh, Selma Hayek and Bono and so on. It's, uh, things have changed a lot in the last six or seven years. And it was fairly lonely early on in the 70s and 80s. And it was not easy to find people. First of all, you couldn't find a normal person who even knew what you were talking about. Uh, and, uh, and, and even less likely to find, find somebody who would be interested in what you were talking about. Uh, so, um, so it's been fairly recently that these issues have, uh, have become popularized, which is very exciting uh, in reality, and I'll be going over that. Uh, but early on, if you could get to see the chief economist of the World Bank, it was pretty exciting. Um, uh, it's a whole different ball game now, and these issues are uh, really front and center for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, however, uh, uh, and as a transition, by the way, let me say that uh, uh, about six or seven years after his visit to Middlebury, Eduardo Monlan was murdered by the Portuguese secret police. Um, uh, for uh, uh, his leadership there. Um, but his family, his wife and kids and now grandchildren are all still in Mozambique and I'm lucky enough to see them at least once a year when I visit. So that's, that's been a terrific uh, interpersonal element of all of it. Uh, in any case, um, in spite of the fact that uh, issues of global development uh, have not uh, bit really been receiving a whole lot of attention. Um, an unparalleled amount of progress has taken place over the past 30 years. In fact, more uh, health, more education, more literacy, more nutrition, more safety has been delivered to more people over the past 30 years than in all the rest of human history combined. Um, since you're all literate, I won't go over the, uh, this list of indicators. Um, but basically it says uh, lots of people are surviving, um, lots of people are living longer and healthier lives, um, lots of people are not sick, um, lots of people are better nourished, lots of people are wealthier, um, they are having far, far fewer children um, and countries that were absolutely impoverished 30 years ago are wealthier than we are today. Uh, so nothing like this has ever happened. When I was at Middlebury, except for the U.S. and Western Europe, everyone was equally poor. Everyone in the world was hungry. Everyone in the world uh, was dead by the time they were 40, everyone else. Um, everybody was illiterate. Um, the Koreans were hungry and illiterate. The Thais were hungry and illiterate. The Malaysians were hungry and illiterate. The Mexicans were the Brazilians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, when I began field work in the late 60s, early 70s, um, I would uh, visit South Korea and Thailand and Malaysia and so on and so forth. And life expectancy was 40. Um, they had 20%, 25% uh, literacy rates. Life expectancy in these countries is now 80. So in one generation, I mean, the, the grandparents uh, lived to be 40, and their granddaughters have a life expectancy of over 80 in one, one or two generations. So nothing like it um, has ever happened before. Uh, and it's basically been simple. Uh, uh, technologies, clean water and sanitation, basic literacy, um, oral rehydration therapy, uh, uh, antibiotics um, that have made all this happen. Uh, one of my first visits when I took over, say, the children back in the mid-90s was to Vietnam. And Vietnam was um, uh, in these same kinds of conditions. We were doing a national therapeutic nutrition program in Vietnam for the 30% of the children in Vietnam that were severely malnourished 12 years ago. Um, 
you go to Vietnam today and you meet with families and the parents are about four foot nine to five foot two and their kids are about five foot nine to six feet um, in one generation. So you stand there in a household and you see um, what nutrition um, has done. We have a big micro lending program in, uh, in Vietnam now for rural uh, women. And the, the outreach workers, um, who are all uh, university graduates in economics, um, are all their daughters, um, who have all uh, gone to universities and gotten their, uh, their degrees in economics. So in one generation, people have gone from the 13th century to the 21st century. Uh, and that's, uh, that's happened in 80% of the world. And that's happened without really a whole lot of real serious attention being brought to these issues. Uh, so probably 80% of the absolute poverty in the world today is concentrated in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and these issues of eliminating uh, absolute poverty are, are really concentrated in those two regions of the world. Rural India, um, where probably a third of the poorest live, still China, rural China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Congo, Nigeria, um, in those eight or nine countries, 75% of the hungry, sick, illiterate people are concentrated. But the rest of the world um, um, is not any of those things. They have a new set of problems in lots of cases, but uh, uh, severe malnutrition and uh, illiteracy and stunting and disease are not, are not the problems in Latin America, the Middle East, East Asia any longer. Um, so, uh, so although uh, lots of good things have happened, um, lots of problems remain. <coughs> Having said that, um, the, the methodologies and how to do it and the institutions to make it happen are all in place. Uh, so it is not a technical or administrative or managerial challenge to finish the job. Um, and my own guess is that it will, in terms of, again, absolute poverty, making poverty history in the sense of severe malnutrition, illiteracy, disease, in the lifetime of those of you who are students, um, it will be in the dustbin of history. Um, and I would, uh, for all of you interested and who feel you have a calling for this kind of work, really encourage you to be engaged because it's, uh, it's very exciting what's going on. And, and in spite of what we all see on the front pages of the newspaper about the, uh, the failed states and the problems, the reality is 75% of even the poorest of the poor today are progressing. <clears throat> and the blueprint to get this done are the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and again, until 15 years ago, um, there was no game plan at all about anything. So once again, it's kind of a minor miracle that as much progress has taken place as has taken place, given the fact that nobody knew what they were doing, no one knew what anybody else was doing. Uh, there wasn't any strategy in reality to make it all happen. And still a lot of uh, uh, an unprecedented amount of positive things um, did occur between 1970 and 1995. Uh, but um, starting about 15 to 20 years ago, uh, the world did begin establishing these uh, mechanisms for creating strategic plans around so global social development. Um, and uh, 
there was a original Health for All uh, 1980 summit in Alma-Ata in the former Soviet Union at the time. Um, there was an Education for All summit and then a follow-up in Dakar about 10 years ago. Um, in the early 1990s, under Jim Grant of UNICEF, there was a global summit on children that endorsed the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and then, finally, uh, at the end of the 1990s, um, the ministers and heads of state all gathered to uh, um, set global goals for the 21st century, which are uh, listed there. Um, so um, that's the, uh, uh, the game plan, and they each have a, a strategy uh, broken down to the country level. Everything's costed, who has to do what, where, when, and how in each of these areas. Um, poverty alleviation, malnutrition, uh, primary education, gender equity, under five mortality, maternal mortality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are uh, plans right down, really, essentially, to the district and provincial level all over the world of what has to happen uh, to make poverty history. Um, and uh, since this was all promulgated in 1999-2000, a lot of progress has been made. Um, so uh, it's been accelerated. Things are happening more quickly than they would have happened without all of this. Um, but these goals are not going to be achieved under current circumstances, um, <clears throat> uh, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. So a lot of the key challenges um, um, have to do with Af African development and uh, 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 creating the conditions in, in Africa that will allow all of this to happen. There are also uh, real questions about, uh, obviously, Pakistan um, and rural India, and particularly because of the, uh, not the role of women, but the, uh, the, the treatment of women. The great challenge for India is not whether they have the resources or the capacity or the, um, uh, the wherewithal, um, but there are more almost half of all the mal malnourished girls in the world are in India. Uh, so uh, there are huge uh, uh, challenges in, in uh, the treatment of girls and, and women in India. That's a real challenge there. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, I, I would say, uh, to oversimplify, I mean, what's happened over the past 30 years in terms of global social development um, is that the low-hanging fruit has been picked. Um, and probably Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and Thailand and Malaysia and so on and so forth would have developed anyway, um, just so long as the technologies were available, they were probably likely to adapt them et cetera, et cetera, down through the, the chapters of the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and the remaining challenges are, are the most difficult. So I do think the issues of uh, social development in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia are more challenging than they were when I started doing this in Latin America and East Asia. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there is a lot more energy, money, talent, and attention um, that's being brought to these more demanding issues. So the job can definitely be done. Um, and uh, if the momentum is sustained, uh, probably will be done. But the architecture or the, uh, uh, the nature of the work and now of achieving the Millennium Development Goals, generating economic and social development has changed totally in the last 10 years. Um, until uh, 10 years ago, uh, first of all, 75% of our funding came from governments at Save the Children, and that was typical. 
and probably 90% of all the funding um, for development came from governments, either directly or indirectly, either directly through AID or DFID or JICA, um, or indirectly through the World Bank and uh, UNDP and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> uh, so probably 15 or 20 people, the heads of these agencies, ran the development assistance show and CARE and Save the Children and UNICEF more or less implemented what, what they came up with. Um, and we'd try to influence them, and sometimes we would, but they made the final decisions. Um, that is no longer the case. Um, in fact, in 2005, for the first time, the more than 50% um, of all development assistance came from new non-traditional sources. So not from the World Bank, not from the normal suspects, meaning the G7 and the Scandinavians. Um, and essentially, since the UN agencies and the World Bank were also all funded by those same 10 governments, 90% uh, uh, development assistance was either voluntarily or involuntarily from the taxpayers of the United States, Japan, Germany, Norway, Sweden, et cetera, et cetera. Whole different ballgame today. 44% um, of all development assistance now comes from private sources. Um, and another 10% comes from non-traditional donors, uh, meaning India, China, Saudi Arabia, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I'm heading off next week to Dubai to pick up a $40 million check from Dubai Cares. Um, I actually didn't even know where Dubai was five years ago. <laughs> um, and they uh, raised a billion dollars as a society in three weeks um, to address Millennium Development, the, the Education Millennium Development Goal. And this is from school children and university students and so on and so forth. So um, a whole different ball game. And at Save the Children, now 70% uh, of our funding comes from private sources. Probably only 20% comes from the US government. Um, and uh, our staff members, again, who 10 years ago needed to be experts on USAID procurement policies and strategies now have to manage 30 or 40 major donors. So the people who help had our health programs or our education programs um, are working with all kinds of important new players. And it's a much more entrepreneurial, creative, but difficult task. Um, in addition to the actual program delivery and resource allocation. Um, uh, another whole role um, is the creation of political will and disseminating information about these issues to much larger numbers of people. So here we are. Uh, on, on the upper left, uh, left left is uh, <laughs> yeah, it's George Clooney. Uh, that's me on the right. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the point is uh, that without more attention, uh, these issues are not going to get resolved. Um, and it's not just the money, um, it's the support. It's the volunteering, it's the engagement, all kinds of things are, are going to be needed. And, uh, um, and also creativity and uh, innovation. Uh, and whatever else governments do, um, innovation and creativity is generally not a direct output. Um, so, uh, so a lot of people um, have uh, have gotten into this, um, and you know, uh, 
Bill and Melinda Gates, I do think, kind of modeled um, what you can do with a spare 40 or 50 billion. Um, and so other people, like Warren Buffett, have started to become interested, and the Emir of Dubai and lots of other people. I think we're only seeing the beginning of this. Um, an awful lot of people have made an awful lot of money, and even with the current economic uncertainties, um, an awful lot of people have made an awful lot of money. In 2006, 2007, um, in order to make the top 100, the list of the top 100 hedge fund managers, uh, you had to individually and personally make $186 million in one year. So if you made $185 million, you weren't on the list. Um, and even, again, with the uncertainty, those folks probably made another 15 or 20 percent in the past year. So. Uh, so I think the model is there, that you give your children a billion or two and then you spend the rest um, on global well-being. And, uh, and a lot of that, um, I think, will be happening. And uh, because the problems are more challenging, um, I think it's very important that the solutions are likely to be more creative and innovative than they have been in the past. Where uh, is now, so there's uh, over $70 billion a year of private funding going into global development. Um, and the, there are the five places that it is coming from. Um, the first are the mega philanthropists, and there are 20 or so that are probably putting half a billion or more um, into these kinds of issues. George Soros, Ted Turner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, the uh, corporate world obviously um, has been going global for the past 40 years um, and, uh, uh, and for their own branding and business reasons um, uh, and customer relations and political rationale and all the rest of it are looking uh, to move the needle on global change and to find partners to work with on doing this. Uh, so that uh, uh, represents a uh, major opportunity because the fact is probably 95% of the talent and technology and capital in the world exists in the corporate world. Um, and so directing that to these issues of making poverty history um, is hugely important. Now, that's not their mission. Um, and it's not what they ought to be focusing on um, in that sense, but, uh, but in the sense that they want positive global brands and good political relations and happy staff. Um, it's one of the things that they are likely to do and are doing. Um, and particularly, actually, on the staff side, we have big global relationships with uh, Boston Consulting Group and McKinsey, et cetera, because um, their employees find it rewarding to work on these social issues as well as the business and economic issues they spend most of the time working on. They stay with them longer, so they have a good business reason to do it. Um, we've talked about the celebrities um, who can bring uh, um, attention to the issues because the fact of the matter is, um, once again, most people um, are not getting up in the morning and thinking about uh, chronic nutrition or agricultural development in, among pastoralists in the Ogaden. Um, and uh, Alice, I was two weeks ago in Ethiopia and the Agadan with uh, Salma Hayek and Jessica Lang, because how else am I going to get people to pay any attention to what's going on there? I'm certainly not going to do it on my own, and I'm not going to get on the talk shows and um, uh, do TV spots and so on and so forth, but these people can really do it. For those of you who are interested in what's going to be, we are going to 
be featured on Idol Gives Back uh, next Wednesday. So if you want to see the mass media in action and celebrities in action, everybody's going to be, even Bono and you name it, will be on there. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> I'm not singing, no. Uh, uh, I must, you know, I mean, some of these people I've never even heard of before, but <laughs> um, the, the young lady who is Hannah Montana <laughs> spent three days working in our programs. Apparently, a life-changing experience for her. Um, and so she's out, you know, talking up global development and U.S. development. Uh, and for people, I gather, 13 to 7 or 8, um, they really listen. So, <laughs> uh, so in any case, you will see her next Wednesday, uh, 7.30 to 9.30. Um, Eli Manning and Peyton Manning went to our programs in New Orleans, uh, sort of post-Katrina kinds of things. It's whatever it takes. Uh, and, it, and it obviously brings attention to the issues and gets people involved. And Idle Gives Back last year raised $72 million in an hour. Uh, so we're not, uh, uh, you know, this is a, what we, it, I can laugh at it, but uh, um, obviously it makes a huge difference. And the attention makes a big difference. And we didn't used to have it. So for those of you who decide you want to do this work, it's a lot more fun now than it used to be. <laughs> Um, so I mentioned the new bilaterals, uh, and uh, we just also got a major grant from um, uh, the, the government of Korea, where we were working 25 years ago and delivering basic, uh, basic needs. So um, uh, it, it has become a, a global phenomenon, and that's going to be a very healthy uh, reality that it's not just a Western monopoly, um, that human well-being is a shared responsibility, and uh, it's going to be complicated, I think, um, actually, um, in terms of some of the political dynamics and how these new donors are going to feel about American and Western institutions and the traditional domination of this industry um, by Western ways of thinking. but. Uh, but in the end, um, really exciting and important, in my opinion. So I think the globalization and kind of Allison's study, not the privatization of development assistance, but the diversification um, is, is really big, really important, and really positive. Um, and that's, uh, that's the last group. There are now hundreds of millions of people campaigning all over the world on these issues. Um, uh, as a result, I think, of all the other, other factors that we've talked about. Um, however, um, it makes the work uh, much more complicated. Um, and it is really an unguided system now. Um, and even with the Millennium Development Goals and so on as a frame, because the participants, uh, the celebrities, the philanthropists, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the governments, um, think so differently um, and um, are looking at it in such different ways. Um, there is no rhyme or reason to what's being done. Um, and $175 billion a year is too much money, I think, to be spending without any form of dialogue, even. And 27,000 children a day are too many to die because different players want to carry out these responses in their own particular ways. Um, and I am spending 75 or 80% of my time on these coalition forming um, endeavors. And I just got off the phone, had an 8 to 9 a.m. 
teleconference this morning from down at the inn on the green with the Prime Minister and Prime Minister's Office of Norway and uh, um, the uh, WHO Vice President in Geneva and uh, Gates Foundation representatives from Seattle and so on and so forth, not to drop a whole lot of names, but to say trying to get this thing pulled together um, and get the right hand uh, shaking the left hand and on and on is huge. Um, and you're not going to get everybody to salute uh, the same plan, but you can, I think, you can get, you certainly can get people talking a lot more uh, interactively and regularly than um, is currently the case. However, um, uh, one of the challenges of this whole process and, and campaigning is that, once again, it is not being done strategically. I mean, Save the Children has big campaigns on millennium, the health millennium development goals, four, five, and six, child mortality, maternal mortality, infectious diseases. Um, <clears throat> and it's quite successful, and it's going to get more successful. Um, the HIV people um, and malaria have been quite successful. Um, but as a result, funding for gender programs and education programs has gone down. So um, uh, uh, without uh, kind of pushing a collaborative strategy, an overall strategy, and linking one piece to another, how are people, uh, you, me, no, to know what to, fo to focus on, and let alone senators and members of Congress and parliamentarians and so on and so forth. So, uh, so the campaigning, I think, is, uh, is important, um, but somehow it's got to get linked up better and more strategically uh, than is the case at the moment. Uh, so here are some of the things that... Uh, that Save the Children is doing to, uh, uh, to try to engage and deliver some uh, um, coordination to, uh, to the process. And there are a lot of fora. Probably none of these existed um, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and again, I, this is what I do for a living now. I mean, I attend gatherings to try to pull these issues together. Um, and that's a, a list of what a, a bunch of them are. Uh, Save the Children uh, was established in Europe in, uh, out of the UK in 1919 at the end of World War I. Um, and uh, there are 28 different Save the Children's in Japan and Spain and Italy and Norway and Fiji and Lesotho, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and for decades, we all went our own way and ran our own programs and so on and so forth. And we are essentially in the process of merging now um, in order to have more strategic impact on these issues. Um, uh, so, uh, so slowly, slowly, uh, uh, these forces are, I think, uh, creating... Uh, better responses, but the reality is it still uh, uh, needs a huge amount of thinking and a huge amount of work of how to make this a more rational process. So for any of you who go into this work, I think you can expect to uh, apply um, some brain power and time and energy to trying to come up with um, better forms than the ones that we have at the moment. Um, we've got our, our several different global campaigns going on parts of the MDGs that are not being addressed that you can see. I could give a whole talk on this, but we're running out of time, so I'm not going to do it. Um, um, but we have identified elements of the Millennium Development Goals that aren't being addressed and won't be achieved and so on and so forth, and we are really leveraging a lot of activity and focus and so on and so forth to make them happen. And there we are. Um, so, um, thank you for your attention. Um, and I would...
love to answer any questions you might have, hear any comments. I'm amazed. <laughs> just as background, Charlie, you mentioned the, the incredible growth in this area over 30 or 40 years. What, what's happened in the last 12 or 15 years that's broken all of us? When I was working with you, we were worried about keeping safe the children's building. Yeah. Oh, we still worry about that. But uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of things. Um, but uh, my immediate reaction is uh, uh, Bono and Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a proponent of the great person theory of history in general, and there are probably reasons why they came forward um, when they did and in the ways they did. Um, and, uh, and maybe th a little more thoughtfully than that, than my answer about Bono and Bill and Melinda, um, is that um, the, the enormous wealth that has been generated in the last 20 years has been generated globally <clears throat> um, and through innovation and technology and large scale thinking. Um, so as Andrew Carnegie would think about libraries in the United States 120 years ago, I think George Soros, who came earlier than Bill and Melinda and so on, made their money thinking about uh, what's happening globally, what's not being done right, where money can be made, where leverage can be had. Um, so I think it was probably very likely that out of that way of... of accumulating wealth and, and achieving missions, people would come who would think in these kinds of terms. And Bono, I mean, he, you know, he, he sings everywhere, and I'm sure he and his managers are thinking about concerts, were thinking about concerts in India and China and so on and so forth 20 years ago. So I think it's probably globalization. Um, I think that one of the common criticisms that's sort of leveled at um, NGOs today is that there are so many non-governmental organizations right. today that we are actually sort of creating a situation of dependency on the ground in Saharan Africa and Latin America um, because NGOs are starting to supplant social programs that governments really should be providing but they're not um, and that it can actually undermine sort of uh, the progression that governments should be heading towards. So governments in these countries should start to do more in the way of social services and social programs and that maybe we are sort of, it's a planting that we're kind of not helping governments attain sort of legitimacy or sort of a responsibility that they need to, to take. And I'm just wondering what, what your response to that criticism is, um, if any. Um, well, uh, I would not want my children's health and education to be dependent on, entirely dependent on government. I wouldn't want anybody else's, as I have spent these 35 years working with governments. Um, uh, the, mono the government monopoly model, um, I have not found to be very convincing. Um, so I do think pluralism and competition and checks and balances, as untidy as it is, um, is better than the alternative. Um, in general, but certainly in terms of health and education and nutrition and so on and so forth. So the mixed model, um, to me, works better. And the idea, you know, uh, when I began of the giant Ministry of Health and the giant Ministry of Education and the national plan and the monopoly of the state um, has not worked for a variety of reasons. Um, having said that, Government is necessary. They have roles. There are lots of things they have to do. Um, they have to set the framework. They have to probably provide the kind of spinal column of these systems. There are roles for governments, which will vary from culture to culture in reality. Um, but always um, there's a needed role. So I'm certainly nobody in their right mind would be a proponent, uh, I think, of uh, irrelevant government um, and underfunded, incompetent uh, 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 government. And, 
and so it, it's a, it, is, it is a balancing process. And, uh, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, since I have singled that out as the real battleground of the next 25 years, capacity building is going to have to be massive, both with the government and uh, civil society and, and village people. And that's happening slowly, slowly. And in fact, in, in my sphere, essentially, uh, you know, UNICEF does the government building and works with the ministries and so on and so forth. And we work with civil society and households. And, and to a certain extent, if the resources were there, you, you'd probably have a reasonable overall strategy. We work pretty closely with UNICEF and vice versa on how to, how to balance all of that. I mean, our collective problem is the resources aren't adequate. But, uh, um, but this uh, strategy of balanced development on the one hand with checks and balances between uh, civil society and government, in, in my opinion, is, is the right way. And I wouldn't advocate for civil society getting it all but I definitely wouldn't advocate for government getting it all either. Maybe to reflect that a little bit, um, you talked about issues of creativity with government sources and uh, maybe incompetent or lack of competence. There was a time when one felt that it was inefficiency and corruption that were the issues in terms of aid that was given and not really overseen. Has the oversight question changed with the way the philanthropy is changing? Well, the, the answer is certainly yes. Um, now, I'm not sure I would uh, would have found the government wasn't uh, wasn't monitoring pretty closely all along, at least in what I had seen of it. Um, part of the issue um, what were the distortions and how the the funding was allocated. Whenever you get the big political uh, investments, Vietnam during the war, Egypt, Israel, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, you, you get unbelievable corruption and, and lack of control because that's not what the money's being given for. Um, and so, and that's often 50, 60 percent of, you know, for foreign assistance. And we have tended not to work in those kinds of places. We save the children. And NGOs tend not to be involved in that. So you get Bechtel and the contractors and Blackwater and so on. Um, and that's chaos. Um, but, you know, the entire development assistance budget of all the donors in Mali might be $100 million a year. And AID might have $10 million. And they're pretty careful about that. They micromanage it um, in reality. So, uh, so there's that uh, distinction. Uh, the new donors um, are, and the, the, the private donors are fanatic about accountability. Um, so, you know, they put you through the tortures of the damned. Um, and it costs money um, to do real evaluation in, in Darfur or Congo or whatever. Uh, and, and in general, most of the donors are measuring project and program outcomes and not strategic outcomes. The only donor we have that's measuring strategic outcomes is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and they have given us $120 million um, so far, and that's openers. Um, to reduce newborn mortality by 50%. Um, and basically, they, you know, we sat down with them now six years ago and said, how long is it going to take? Where is it going to have to happen? What's going to happen every quarter between now and 2022 in order to make it happen? How are we going to measure it? Um, country, you know, province by province, country by country, globally, how are we going to aggregate it? How are we going to do it every quarter for 20 years? Um, now that's fantastic um, because there's an overall context. They're the only donor out of 4,000 donors that we have, 4,000 institutional donors um, that is doing that. Everybody wants to know, you know, how many drops of water were squeezed, you know, into some well 
in Gaza province in Mozambique. They drive us crazy. Um, and, uh, and it's not useful. You, you, you have to do some of that. We, we're doing now a randomized sample with a poverty center at MIT. We're doing a lot of models of how to do it. Uh, but you wouldn't want to do that in every single program, and there are ways to randomize things and so on and so forth. So, um, so on the one hand, um, I think there's some good work being done on monitoring and evaluation, and there's a lot more demand um, on impact measurement. Um, but this question of strategic impact and moving the needle at large scale, almost nobody is doing it. In the end, it's the name of the game. So, so it goes with the whole song I'm singing here about um, growing up, so to speak, and realizing that these are global issues and aggregate issues and large scale issues. And one of the big problems with international philanthropy and the thousands of agencies, who knows, you know, who to give to, um, is all but six or seven organizations, maybe all but three or four organizations, are actually only working on projects. And they have great projects, but, you know, anybody smart can do great projects. It's not hard to know what a great project looks like um, and do it. And it does go back to this question of government and, and, and the structure, because um, because if you're not doing it at the end of the day, strategically, you're not really changing the conditions for the bottom billion. You know, you can change it for 50,000 people, which is nice for them, but what about the other billion? Yes? I mean, I'm from Afghanistan, and I have a question uh, about some criticism and, I guess, accusations that have been leveled that how NGOs and organizations are spending more money on themselves than they're spending it on their projects. Uh, what they say, for example, is that you spend more money on your car, salaries, and housing. Uh, I would be keen to know how do you react to that. And secondly, uh, if you don't work with governments uh, in those countries, for example, with the Afghan government, where does that lead uh, the Afghan government in terms of its legitimacy to its own people? So when you deliver something and they don't have the power to deliver to its people, uh, uh, I mean, I'm more keen to know your right. view and how do you react to that. Thank you. Uh, really good questions. We do work with governments. Um, and it does have to be a partnership. And we're not there to, uh, to create an alternative delivery system. Um, we are there to create a balanced delivery system and at the end to make sure there are lots of citizens who feel ownership of their school or their clinic or their, their property. Um, but that the government's also providing the support that is needed for the whole system to work. And in a place like Afghanistan, obviously, uh, the, the need to have government legitimacy is ov overwhelming. Um, but if you waited, if, the, if people in the villages of Afghanistan waited until the government was fully structured to deliver on a national basis from the top down, they would be still waiting for anything. So you need to build from the top down and the bottom up simultaneously, and we, we certainly do that. Um, lots of NGOs don't. It's, it's not really that we're smarter. We're certainly not smarter or even better, but we are bigger. Um, and so we have the resources to simultaneously work with ministries and governments and universities and so on at the macro level and deliver um, the, the village activities. Uh, a lot of NGOs don't, and I think that is a problem. Uh, <clears throat> we, we NGOs certainly don't live nearly as well as the UN or the World Bank. In fact, we live one-third as well. <clears throat> we get paid one-third as much, and we spend one-third as much on our offices and facilities and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, but we spend more than national organizations, and in some places we spend more than ministries. Uh, and one reason for that is that the ministries don't have enough to do the job responsibly, and we do. <clears throat> uh, but that's, that's a real problem. Uh, 
you know, we uh, uh, are a global organization operating off of a global platform and we can bring technology anywhere um, and we can't work the way we work without it. Um, and and we, we have more bicycles and motorcycles than we have Land Rovers, but we also need some Land Rovers or four-wheel drive vehicles. But I bet we have fewer, I bet all the NGOs combined have fewer four-wheel drive vehicles than families in Fairfield County, so it's a little bit uh, complicated. Um, so the core problem is the underfunding and the, the misallocation of global resources and how little is out there still to get these basic jobs done. And that puts us in a little bit of a par paradox or dilemma and we try to balance it as best we can by being more careful of how we look and what we do and so on and so forth and how we live than most outsiders. Um, but to work the way we work, <clears throat> um, we have capacities that often um, local civil society organizations don't have. It allows us to have more impact. I mean, we were talking, when, when I came to Save the Children, we were really living on chewing gum and bailing wire, and, uh, and it was inadequate, and we weren't getting as much done. And so when a ministry is underfunded or an Afghan civil society organization is underfunded, um, the real problem is to get them the resources they need to do the job, not to kind of have NGOs, I think, operating without the technical and other capacities that get the job done. I'll go back here. This will be the last question. Um, we were going to speak here in this room on Tuesday. You touched briefly on the idea of appropriate technology mm -hmm. in the developing world. And I've heard both sides of that argue, but his point was that we don't need solar-powered wells in rural Africa. We need foot-powered wells in, in, in rural Africa. And there's this idea that maybe the developed world shouldn't be exporting the best of what it has. It should be developing, or it should be exporting it's kind of more rudimentary technology that is somehow more appropriate in the developing world. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, well, it's not either or. First, that would be my first thought. I mean, it's, uh, there, um, there need to be some Western technologies uh, uh, provided and there need to be uh, lots of customized technologies. Uh, something like 500 million people have never seen soap. And I had a public health Nobel laureate tell me more lives have been saved by soap than any other scientific invention in human history. So whether that's Western or appropriate technology or whatever, hygiene, I mean, we have huge programs with millions of people on hand washing. Millions of children die, you know, from essentially dirty hands. <clears throat> so yes, you know, uh, if, in my opinion, right, that's a, you know, that's a pretty basic technology and putting money and Bill Gates gave this speech on, on the technology gap. And he said, let's solve the soap gap first and then you know, worry about the uh, computer gap afterwards. Uh, and if you have to make that choice, um, and, and in lots of places you do have to make that choice, um, it definitely has to be appropriate technology or customized technology. Um, one of the really interesting things going on right now is this coalition for a green revolution in Africa. Again, we've talked a lot about Africa, and in the end, um, one of the huge problems of Africa is that it has terrible soil in general. Um, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, kind of e ecosystems difficulties, and they're going to get more difficult with global warming. <clears throat> um, so it's essential. But they're going to have to invent the technologies. I mean, they don't exist at the moment. So, uh, so that would be kind of the ultimate example of, of your point, I think, which is not just the pedal pumps, but determining what interventions from scratch you know, can deal with the kinds of soil 
uh, patterns that exist in most of Africa. You've all been more than patient and kind. For those of you who uh, want to make a lifetime work out of this, stay on. For everyone else, thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.